Chapter 3, Section 4, Concavity, and the Second Derivative Test. Now, the second derivative, I mentioned in the first, uh, in the last uh, video that the first derivative test and the second derivative test kind of test for the same thing. The first derivative test is called the first derivative test because it involves the first derivative, not because it was first. And the second derivative test is going to involve the second derivative function, not because uh, it's the second one that's listed. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to look to see when our function f, ha which intervals in which its derivative is increasing or its derivative is decreasing. Not when the function's increasing or decreasing, but when the derivative is increasing or decreasing. And these uh, um, ideas where f prime is increasing or f prime is decreasing is referred to as concavity up. Now, what does it mean when f prime is increasing? It means that if you looked at the slopes of the tangent lines from left to right, that the, the slopes would be getting bigger. Now, way up here, here's a function that's increasing. Okay, here's a function that's increasing. Look here, the slopes of the tangent lines are getting bigger. Look right here, the slopes of the tangent lines, although that wasn't a very good tangent line, are getting smaller. They're both increasing functions, but they're shaped differently. This one's curved kind of upward. This one's kind of curved downward. This is where we bring in the idea of what we call concavity, where a graph is concave up or it's concave down. So let's define concavity. Oops. Concavity, it says let f be differentiable on an open interval i. The graph of f is concave upward on i if f prime is increasing like I was trying to show you here, f prime is increasing, the slopes of the tangent lines are getting bigger, because that's what this f prime is, it's the slopes of the tangent lines, it is increasing and they're on concave down or to concave downward on an interval y, if f prime is decreasing, like I tried to show you back here, that the slopes are getting smaller. The graph of f is concave upward on i, then the graph of f lies above all of its tangent lines on i. The graph of f is concave downward on i if the graph of f lies below all of its tangent lines. So notice here, in the red, that's your curve. Look down here. See how my tangent lines, when I draw them, are all below the graph? See how it would hold water? This is concave upward. Okay? This is the first one. Here, all my tangent lines, again, the graph is in, in red here, uh, my, all my tangent lines lie above my curve. This doesn't hold water. This is concave downward. Concave upward, concave downward. Concave up, concave down sometimes. All right, to find where f is concave upward or concave downward, since it has to do with f prime increasing or decreasing, we look at the second derivative. The second derivative gives us the concavity test. All right, now, if you're thinking, God, there's a lot of stuff that talks like dentist uh, in calculus. Calculus is that kind of grimy buildup on teeth. Uh, if you look it up, that's a definition of calculus. We've got transcendental functions. Now we have cusp, where we have like a pointy part on the graph, and a cusp, of course, being part of the, uh, the tooth. And now we have concavity. Uh, cavity being, of course, not so good in dentist. A lot of dentist terms here. Anyway, I threw that in for free. The concavity test says, let f be a function whose second derivative exists on an open interval i. The second derivative does. If f double prime of x is greater than zero for all x and i, then the graph of f is concave upward on i, okay? Because the uh, slopes are increasing of the tangent lines. If f double prime of x is less than zero for all x uh, in the interval i, then the graph of f, of, uh, the graph of f is concave downward on i. Now, if f double prime of x equals zero for all x and i, then we have a line. It's linear. It's not concave upward. It's not concave downward. A line is neither concave up nor concave down. Concavity is not defined for a line. All right. With that stated, we should try an example. Now, our first example is a pretty straightforward one because that's your parent graph for your quadratic function. We know what this is. This is a parabola vertex at 0, 0 opens upward. Well, we already know that this is concave upward. Let's check this out. If I take the first derivative, I get 2x. If I take the second derivative, I get 2, which is greater than 0 for all x, for the entire domain. 
So in this case, this thing is concave upward. Now, again, I just like to abbreviate it because I'm a little lazy. It's concave upward from negative infinity to infinity. It's concave downward, uh, well, not at all, for no interval, okay? Now this next guy, since it's got a, per, uh, a trig function in it, you know how the trig function concave down, concave up, concave down, it's changing back and forth. We're gonna look at this at the, on the closed interval from zero to two pi. Now all the three does is it takes our parent function y equals the sine of x and raises it three units upward, okay? But I'm gonna take the derivative. The derivative of three is zero, the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. I'm gonna take the second derivative I would get negative sine x. I'm gonna take negative sine x, set it equal to zero, because I wanna know where it's equal to zero so I can determine when it's uh, positive and when it's negative. So I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna multiply both sides by negative one, and I am gonna get zero pi and two pi. Now I'm trying to figure out the open intervals for where this is defined very much like I did for increasing and decreasing. I draw a number line, but this number line is for an F double prime. And I put down zero and two pi, because that was the endpoints anyway of my, my closed interval, but there were also critical numbers. And then of course I put pi in here. Take a number from here, like let's say pi over two and plug pi over two in. The sine of pi over two is one, four plus, or three plus one is four. This is positive. Positive for the second derivative means concave upward. So I put a little concave upward symbol like that. The book does it a little bit differently. They set up tables and they put plus signs and minus signs. I kind of like the plus sign and the minus sign on my number line here because I like to kind of consider my x values from left to right. But the uh, plus sign, I don't want to get it confused with increasing so I put the little U shape. Uh, it kind of looks like a union symbol there. Take a value from here like three pi over two like 3 pi over 2 in for uh, the sine of x, the sine, oop, in 3 pi over 2 in for, ah, heavens, the Murgatroyd, I plugged in for the wrong value, take pi over 2, plug pi over 2 in here, heavens, the Murgatroyd, what's wrong with me, I was plugging in into the original function, I hope I didn't mess you guys up, okay, backtrack here, I'm not going to plug my pi over 2 into f, I'm plugging in f prime, the sine of pi over 2 is 1, and this is negative 1, this is a negative here, which means it's concave down. So kind of like the intersection symbol there. So sorry, I messed that up. I was uh, trying to think of the next problem and I uh, can't uh, write stuff down and think at the same time, apparently. Take three pi over two from this subinterval, plug it in, the sine of three pi over two is negative one, and this would be the opposite of negative one, which is positive one, and therefore this thing is concave upward. So it is concave uh, downward on the open interval from zero to pi. It is concave upward on the open interval from pi to two pi. All right, now, let's see, did I get this graph here? All right, let's see. Oh, hang on a second here. All right, so there's three plus the sine. So let me go ahead and graph this. So let's go to trig number seven here. Let's see what we have. All right, the way I've got this set up that each one of these is pi over two, and you can see that up here it starts concave downward, then it goes to concave upward. So that kind of matches up nicely with it. All right, let's go to this guy here. F of X equals the square root of X squared plus one. This is gonna be a peach. I'm gonna write this as X squared plus one to the one half power. So the first derivative, and this is for all real numbers because of course any number that you plug in here, you square it, it's gonna be uh, non-negative plus one, it's gonna be positive. You can take the square root of a positive number. This is gonna be one half times the quantity X squared plus one to the negative one half times two X, or X all over the square root of X squared plus one. Now I need the second derivative so the second derivative, I'm gonna to have to do uh, not only a, a chain rule, but I'm gonna to have to do a quotient rule here. So it's the denominator, x squared plus one, the square root of x squared plus one times the derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. Well, the derivative of the denominator was the derivative of the, real function, the original function, which is all of this. So this is gonna be times x all over the square root of x squared plus one, 
all over my denominator squared, which is x squared plus 1 to the first power. Now, I'm going to get rid of the uh, fraction within the fraction by multiplying top and bottom by this denominator. So I'm going to write this as the square root of x squared plus 1 pl uh, minus, oops, minus x squared over the square root of x squared plus 1. And that's going to be times the square root of x squared plus 1 uh, over my denominator, which is x squared plus 1 to the first times the square root of x squared plus 1, which is the same as x squared plus 1 to the 1 half. You can probably see why I did that. So up top, I distribute. These are going to cancel. So I'm just going to get, oh, excuse me. These are not going to cancel because that's not in the denominator. That's just messy. This is going to give me x squared plus 1. I hope I will finish this section better than I started it. x squared plus 1 minus, these are going to cancel, and I just get minus x squared all over the, x squared plus 1 to the 3 halves. The x squareds cancel, and I'm hoping you can still read my handwriting here, and that's x squared plus 1 to the 3 halves in the denominator. Well, this is never equal to 0 because my numerator is positive. My denominator is positive because no matter, again, what you plug in for x, when you multiply that out, it's going to be a positive number to 3 halves is positive. So with that stated, I have no values that make it equal to 0, so my number line here for f double prime is either always going to be positive or it's always going to be negative. Take a number from here, take uh, 0, plug it in, well, as I've said, it's always going to be positive. So this guy here is concave up the entire time. So this is concave up from negative infinity to infinity and concave down. None. I'm just going to write none next to it just to emphasize that. So let me get Mr. Calculator out here. And let's see if I can do a halfway decent job here. So this is the square root of x squared plus 1. And that's uh, the square root of that. So raised to the 1 half or 0.5. And I hope I have that right. Let's go ahead and zoom this in and we'll put it on uh, standard here and see if that looks halfway decent. Yeah, I'd say that looks halfway decent. And I think you will agree it, it kind of looks like a, an absolute value function because it kind of looks like a V shape, but that's curved at the bottom. And you just can't tell that because, again, the number of pixels and the way I've got my... Uh, here, we can zoom in maybe a little bit here. Let's see what happens if we zoom in. See if we can show that that's going to be... Yeah, we'll just zoom in and see what happens. Yeah, I think you can see that curve a little bit better there. So this is concave upward on its entire domain. All right, we have one more example here. I wanted to get a rational in here. So let's take the first derivative. Now, of course, x cannot be equal to 1. So let's take the first derivative. So that's uh, quotient rule, low d high minus high d low all over the square of what's below. So this is going to be x squared minus 1 minus x squared. This is going to be negative 1 all over x minus 1 quantity squared. Now, here's something a little nifty you can do. You can think of this as negative 1 times x minus 1 to the negative 2 because now if I take the second derivative here, I don't have to do a quotient rule. I can just go ahead and use the generalized power rule. The negative 2 comes out in front. That'd be a positive 2 times x minus 1 to the negative 3 times the derivative of the interior function, which is 1. So I get 2 all over x minus 1 to the third power. Now, very much like the last example, notice that my second derivative is never equal to 0. I'd like to find those values. They're not called critical numbers because they're for the second derivative. I mean, they're kind of like critical numbers for the second derivative. Uh, but the critical numbers actually come from the first derivative. So there are no values that make it equal to 0. But remember, x can't be 1. So when I draw out my number line here, I'm going to put the 1 down. This is for f double prime. And then I'm going to check. Take a number over here like 0 and plug 0 in. And I get uh, 2 over negative 1, which is negative. Take a number over here like uh, 10. And I get 2 over big number, positive, positive. 
So even though it's not where the second derivative is equal to zero, it's where it's undefined, notice that we have a change in concavity. It goes from concave down to concave up. So when I consider uh, what uh, key values to put on my number line for the second derivative, I'm going to include those values that make the uh, uh, second derivative uh, not exist. So you can kind of see what I've got written down here, or at least I hope you can, from when the second derivative is equal to zero or where the second derivative does not exist. So concave up from one to infinity, concave down or downward from negative infinity to positive one. All right. So again, any x values for which the function is not continuous should be used along with the points that make the second derivative equal to zero, the second derivative not existing here. All right, if the tangent line to the graph exists at a point in which the concavity changes, okay, I know that's a lot. We're coming back to that. The point is called a point of inflection. Let me see if I can draw a picture of that. It's gonna go from concave down to concave up. This point right here, if you try to find uh, the derivative uh, the, uh, and find the slope of the tangent line, it would be undefined. What's happening here is this, this point right here is a very key point. It is called a point of inflection. And I like points of inflection because they separate my, uh, my graph from where it's concave up to concave down. In fact, that's the definition of a point of inflection. If C, let's see if you can read this okay here. If C, F of C is a point of inflection on the graph of F, then either F double prime of C is equal to zero or F is not differentiable at X equals C. All right, of course the converse isn't always true. So a point of inflection is showing us these cutoff points right in here. And if we have points of inflection, we're gonna have change in concavity. Let's see if we can find that. Find all points of inflection. Well, F prime, of x is equal to 2x, can you see that okay? Yep, yeah, 2x plus 3, f double prime of x is equal to 2. Well, there is no point of inflection because my second derivative does not equal 0, nor is it undefined. In fact, if you think about what this graph is, it's a parabola that opens upward, it's always concave upward. So it's not changing from concave upward to concave downward. Now this next guy, it's a quartic, so we're going to have some stuff going on here g prime of x is equal to 4x, oh, no points of inflection. Again, my abbreviation, not a standard abbreviation. Don't use that on the AP test. They're going to wonder what the heck you're trying to figure out. I mean, they're math teachers that are grading your AP test. They could probably figure out what you're talking about, but uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't chance it. I would write it out. Uh, g of x is equal to x to the fourth minus 4x to the third. g prime of x is equal to 4x to the third minus 12x squared. G double prime of x is equal to 12x squared minus 24x. So I'm going to say it's not undefined anywhere. I'm going to set 12x squared minus 24x equal to 0. I'm going to factor out a 12x. And I'm going to solve this. I'm going to get x equals 0 and x equals 2. So on my number line here, and this is my number line for g double prime, I'm going to put down those two key values, 0 and 2, and I'm going to test. If I take a number from here, like negative 1, and plug negative 1 in, I get positive 1 minus 4 times a negative 1. That's going to be 5. That's positive. If I take a number from here, like 1, I get 1 minus 4, which is negative 3. That's negative. I take a number here, like 10, and I get, what, 10,000 minus 4,000. That's positive. So it's concave up, then it's concave down, then it's concave up. Now, uh, because the points exist here at 0 and 2 on my, on my function, I am going to have two points of inflection. My points of inflection, and notice, points mean an ordered pair. Don't just write down 0 and 2. You're going to have to plug in. I'm going to have to plug in 0. I'm going to have to plug in 2. Now, where do you plug the 0 and the 2 in? Do you plug it into the second derivative? No. That was just to determine where the second derivative was equal to 0. You plug the point. You want the point on the graph. You plug it into the original function. Plug 0 in, I get 0. Plug 2 in, I get 16 minus tw what, 32? 16 minus 32 is negative 16. And those are my points of inflection. One more to go. h prime of x. Uh, remember, x cannot equal 1 here. 
So what, I couldn't have a point of inflection at one. I might have a change in concavity, uh, as I think we did this one. Uh, yeah, we did this one in the previous uh, group of examples. But I'm not going to have a point of inflection here. In fact, let's kind of get right to it. Look right here. I just did this problem a little bit ago, and I got a change in concavity here, but not at one because it wasn't defined at one. I mean, the concavity to the left, the concavity to the right are different, but I don't have a point of inflection. So I could go through all these steps again, and if I was doing this problem for the first time, I would go through all these steps, but I know right now there are no points of inflection because this turned out to be the same as the previous example there. I didn't realize I had done that. Did I do that on the others? No, just this guy. Okay. I can live with it. All right. The second derivative can also be used to test for relative extrema. Think about it this way. If I have a graph that is concave downward, so the second derivative is zero, isn't that point on the top of the hill? That would be a relative maximum. If I have a graph that is has part of it that is concave upward, where the second derivative is positive, okay? I have a point down here at the bottom of the valley. That would be a relative minimum. So concave downward, second derivative negative, maximum. Concave upward, second derivative ne uh, positive, minimum. Kind of the opposite of what you might think. So we're going to use this to come up with what we call the second derivative test. And the second derivative test says let f be a function such that f prime of c is equal to 0, and the second derivative of f exists on the open interval containing c. So we find the critical numbers, okay? So because your relative extreme are occur at critical numbers, if f double prime of c is positive, if it's positive, it's concave upward, we have a relative minimum down at the bottom of the valley here, okay? If the second derivative is less than zero, it says that f of x is equal to the, uh, that f of c would be a relative maximum. So if f double prime of c is negative concave downward, notice we have a maximum, a relative maximum. Now if the second derivative uh, your, of your function f of c is equal to zero, it says that the test fails. Now that doesn't mean it's not a min or a max, it's just that the test doesn't fail, and so you'd have to go to the first derivative test, all right? Now, we're going to use the second derivative test to find relative extrema. I didn't leave a lot of space. I hope I can squeeze these in. So first things first, take the first derivative, because I have to find my critical numbers. This is good. Well, you know what? Let's write this as x to the fourth minus 4x to the third, so we don't have to do a product rule. This is 4x to the third minus 12x squared. So I set 4x to the third minus 12x squared equal to 0. I can factor here, uh, 4x squared out, that would leave x minus 3, it looks like, equals 0. So I have critical numbers at x equals 0 and 3. So now I take the second derivative of my function, which is 12x squared minus 24x. Let's plug 0 in. g double prime, hopefully you can still see this, g double prime of 0 would be zero. Uh-oh, test fails. G double prime of three would be uh, 108 minus 72, which is positive. All right, so therefore I have a relative minimum at x equal 3. Now, I don't know what it's the relative minimum of. I'd have to go all the way back and plug 3 in. Uh, what is that? 3 to the fourth, that'd be 81 minus 108 would be negative 27 of negative 27. That would be my actual relative minimum. Now, let's go back here a little bit. Remember how I said the test failed? I would use the first derivative test. Now, my first derivative test, my key values are 0 and 3 for g prime. If I take a number from here and plug it into the first derivative, uh, which is, say, all right here, let's take this number negative 1. That'd be positive. That'd be negative. It's negative. Uh, if I take a value like positive 1 from here, that'd be positive. That'd be negative. That's negative. And then I take a number bigger than 3, like 10. That'd be positive. That'd be positive. That'd be positive. Notice decreasing, decreasing 
It did not change from increase to the decrease and or vice versa. There is no relative extreme value here at x equals zero. So it, this was an example where the second derivative test failed and it failed uh, in this case because there was actually no uh, relative extreme value at that particular x. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. That's why you go back and use the first derivative to test that. All right, next guy up. Definitely didn't give myself enough room. H prime of x would be negative 15 x to the fourth plus 45 x to the second. If I factor out a negative 15 x squared, that would give me 3x squared minus, no, 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 hang on. That would give me x squared minus 3. Oof, almost messed that up. And I set that equal to 0, and I'm going to get x equals 0 and plus or minus the square root of 3. Now I'm going to take the second derivative, which would be negative 60x to the third plus 90x. And I'm going to have three values to plug in. Now I can pretty much see that when I plug zero in here, the test is going to fail because my uh, derivatives, here, let's just put this right underneath here so we have some space. Yeah, we'll just use this piece of paper right here so we have some space. Uh, if I factor out here, uh, now let's just leave it as this. So I am going to take h double prime of negative square root of three. I'm going to take h double prime of zero and I'm going to take h double prime of, this was a negative here, positive the square root of 3. And let's see what happens. If I plug negative uh, square root of 3 in here, yikes, that's going to be negative 9 square roots of 3 times negative 3 is going to be positive 27 square roots of 3. Oop, 27 square roots of 3. Plus, if I plug that in, that's going to be negative, so minus and that's going to be 3 square roots of 3, so that's going to be minus 15 square roots of 3. So that's going to be 12 square roots of 3, which is positive. So I'm thinking right off the bat that I'm going to have a relative minimum at x equal negative square root. I'm going to have a relative, let's see if I can write this out for you guys, a relative minimum at uh, x equal negative square root of 3. I just don't know of how much. All right, now I plug in zero and I get zero. When I plug uh, zero into the second derivative, there it is, and I get zero there. Let's see, gotta make sure I'm doing this right. And then the square root of three, oh, let's see. So that's gonna be negative, this is gonna be negative 27 square roots of three plus 15 square roots of three is equal to um, a positive, or negative 12 square roots of three which is less than zero, so I should have a relative maximum at x equal the square root of three of, and then I gotta figure that out. So we'll plug that in in just a second. Did I do it the first time? Negative square root of three into there. Did I do this right? All of a sudden I got this really bad feeling. I plugged my uh, into my second derivative into here, ah, and I did. I should uh, just stop this video and start all over again, but I've already put too much time in, and I know you guys are getting tired of seeing this, so let me do it again right. Last example is always the worst one here. So my uh, key values here, my uh, critical numbers, scratch all that other stuff, just erase it, are x equals 0 plus or minus square root of 3, so let's try it again. h double prime of negative square root of 3 h double prime of zero, at least I got that one right, that's still zero here because the variable's in both terms, and h double prime of positive square root of three. So if I plug negative square root of three in, cube it, uh, that'd be negative three square roots of three, it'd be 180 square roots of three minus 90 square roots of three is 90 square roots of three, which is positive. So I'm gonna have a relative minimum Okay, a relative minimum uh, of, I don't know how much, at x equals negative square root of 3 here. This is getting so messy. Let me try it again. A relative minimum of some value at x equal negative square root of 3. Uh, this is the test fails. So I might have to use the first derivative test here. 
Uh, and then this is going to be the square root 3, so that's going to just change the sign. So this is going to be negative 180 square root of 3 plus 90 square root of 3 is negative 90 square root of 3, which is less than 0. So I have a relative maximum of a certain amount at x equal to square root of 3. Yikes. All right, now when I plug those numbers in, let's see. Now I actually need those, the values that I had from the begin with because I need to plug into here to find the y values. So they were uh, 12 square roots of 3, and this was negative 12 square roots of 3. So I'm going to kind of cheat there and use that. Now for 0, I need my uh, use my second derivative or my first derivative test here. So here's negative square root of 3, here's 0, here's the square root of 3. All right, now remember we said that this should be a relative min here, so this should go down and then up. So we take a number from here like, oh, I don't know, negative 10. Plug negative 10 into here, that's 10,000, so that's negative 150,000 plus a positive. This is negative. Take a number from here like 1, negative 1, excuse me. So that's negative 15 plus 45 is positive, yep. It goes, this is for uh, h prime, it goes from decreasing to increasing. That makes sense that I have a relative minimum at this x value. Of course, the graph would back that up as well. And then, let's see, um, if I plug in positive 1 here into my first derivative, I have positive, and then I plug in 10, and I have negative. Yep. So this is still increasing, then decreasing. Notice it's increasing, increasing, no uh, relative extrema here at x equals 0. So here are my answers. Now I hope I didn't mess you up so bad with this last example because I uh, plugged into the wrong function. And that's something I always try to emphasize to my students because that happens a lot. You get kind of caught up in the problem and then you plug into the wrong one. But I am using the second derivative test, so I plug my critical numbers into the second derivative to see if they're positive or negative. I had one that was positive and one that was negative. All right, practice, practice, practice these problems, and you will get much, hopefully, much better than uh, uh, the expertise that I tried to show just now.